Hey everyone, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this is uh, part of the Authors at Google series program. And uh, we're fortunate to have James Blake here, uh, professional tennis player uh, number 12 in the world, joining us today. He's out here this week playing at the SAP Open out here in San Jose. And he's coming off a victory last night over an ex-Stanford player. <laughs> Uh, not only that, he's just coming off a finals appearance at the Delray Beach Tournament, and just that's off the heels off a quarterfinal appearance at the Australian Open where he ran into uh, Roger Federer, of course. Um, so we're, we're pleased to have James here. Um, many of you guys I know come to some of these events where we invite a lot of uh, prominent authors who've uh, recently published um, books to come, and, to come and talk to us. This is a, a little bit unique. We haven't traditionally had a lot of uh, professional athletes who've come and, and given us talk. And I think one of the unique aspects about James's book, as someone who's read his book, is that it's actually a book that really transcends beyond just the sports world. Um, you know, I think uh, you know, in a recent interview, somebody asked James, you know, why he didn't wait until his career was over to uh, to write this book. And I think one of his, his answers was, it wasn't really a way. This book wasn't designed to like look back at his career as a professional tennis player, as much as it was to look back at a year in his life where he had a lot of adversity and how he used kind of the foundations of family and friends in his life to kind of come back to come back and, and succeed in, in his career. And I think it's something that if you read it, you don't really have to be a tennis fan, much less a sports fan. Um, it's something that you can actually apply to kind of anything in your life and any career that you have. And I think it's one of the unique things about this book, which actually reached number 15 on the, in the New York Times bestseller list last year. Um, his tennis... His tennis accomplishments are a long list. Um, he's got 10 career singles ATP titles, um, you know, five career ATP doubles titles. Uh, he's uh, currently number 12 in the world. He's reached number four in the world uh, as late as last year when he reached the Masters Cup final. Um, he's coming off uh, um, his last, most, probably one of his proudest accomplishments, I think he will tell you, is, is winning the U.S. Davis Cup, which uh, the team won this, this last December. So he's now a U.S. Davis Cup champion. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, he's also in the, in the Grand Slam tournaments where you probably caught him on TV's uh, two quarterfinal appearances at the, at the U.S. Open and, of course, the memorable Agassi match, which I know James is pretty much tired of talking about. But if you guys have questions about that, it's always this kind of uh, one match a lot of people look back to. But, um, and he's, uh, as, as I mentioned, has a quarterfinal appearance in the Australian Open. So we are pleased to have James here today. And uh, without further ado, let me uh, welcome him to the podium. This one or this one? All right. Thanks. Um, thanks, to everyone, for coming. Um, it's an honor to be here at Google, one of the, I guess, the, the cutting edge company in the, in the world. So I'm, uh, I'm a little overwhelmed since I am, like you say, you don't have too many professional athletes here. I'm much more comfortable with a racket in my hand than a microphone. So bear with me. But um, I guess. Uh, what I was told is I come here and talk a little bit about myself, which is sometimes a little uncomfortable, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Um, uh, the reason I wrote this book, like he said, wasn't exactly to, uh, to speak to tennis fans. Uh, in fact, the, the person I wrote it with, Andrew Friedman, who uh, in my opinion did a great job, wanted to make it a little bit more about tennis because that's what he knew of me. That's what he thought uh, I wanted to convey to people was about my tennis accomplishments, about uh, everything I had done on the court. And uh, that's what people see uh, every Every time I'm on TV, you could see two hours of me playing tennis, but you don't get to know the person. And what I wanted to do with this book was was let people know a little bit more about the person inside. Um, and in tennis, I think that's that's um, something that really makes a difference to, to fans, is if they really know the person out there. Sometimes they feel like they get a little taste of their emotions on the court. You can tell a guy like Pete Sampras is very calm and reserved out there. You can tell a guy like Murat Safin is a little more emotional. And, and for me, I don't know if I uh, expressed my, my true feelings as much out on the court. So I wanted people to know what I've been going through in life. And um, it, it kind of all hit me at once in 2004. Before that, my career, um, a lot of people probably wouldn't have even wanted to know that much about me. I hadn't, I hadn't uh, had as much success to, to write about or to even fill a pamphlet, much less a book. I, um, I was most likely more known for my hair and one match against Leighton Hewitt in 2001 than, than anything else. So um, in 2004, I, I felt like I was making a lot of progress. Um, uh, on the tennis court, and it, it kind of came to a screeching halt when uh, when I hit a net post in Rome, and 
I guess I, I don't know if I want to give away the whole book in front of, uh, I don't know how many people of you have read it and how many haven't, but I, I had some, some tough times in 2004 and it started with uh, fracturing a vertebrae in my neck in a practice in Rome uh, in May. And um, that coincided with the time I was dealing with my father's illness. He, was, uh, he had a form of stomach cancer that had spread to his lungs and um, we had gotten a pretty, uh, pretty grim diagnosis from, uh, from the doctors. And it, at that time, he, uh, he was a very proud man and, and made sure that I was doing what I loved and doing what I needed to do to further my career. And he made sure I was traveling to Europe. I was playing all the tournaments I needed to play. And um, I know he would have been too proud for, to, to tell me to come home when he was getting worse and worse at that time. And it, um, it kind of reinforced my belief that everything happens for a reason, that I got hurt at that time in Rome um, when I hadn't ever really had an injury like that in my career. And it, it forced me to come home right away. And I spent that, uh, that six weeks was, uh, the last six weeks of my father's life. And I got to spend that with him. And that time was something I, I couldn't have asked for, for more. I couldn't, I, I cherish that to this day. The fact that I had time when I was recovering and that meant I was at home a lot, just spending time with him, whether it was sitting on the bed, watching, watching TV, watching Wimbledon go by, watching the French Open go by, watching uh, any other kind of sports event and just, just sitting there talking. And um, that was something that was, uh, was uh, it was overwhelming to, to be around him and to know that um, it, it was nearing the end. And um, I don't know if there's any other, any other better gift you can get than time. And uh, having that time with him was, was the greatest time I could have and also the most painful time to know that it was ending. And um, obviously, you can tell I had a, a very close relationship with my father, but a lot of that went unsaid. And we had that time to, to say all the things that we had been feeling. And um, when, uh, when that, that finally came to an end, I was, it was, it was a, a weird situation where I was recovering and he was regressing. And um, as I was finally fully recovered, was um, was uh, around July 3rd when he passed away. And he told me the week before, he said, absolutely under no condition are you to miss the tournament that I was scheduled to come back for. That was in Newport, Rhode Island. And um, he said, no matter what happens, you're going to play. My brother at the time was still playing on tour and he was going to go play as well. And he wouldn't let us stay home. And uh, I went and I played and at times somewhat through tears, I played uh, my first round and won. And, uh, Again, things happening for a reason. My body still wasn't ready, and I, uh, I was injured a little and, and started feeling a little sick in my next round match, and um, it made it easy for me to, to get out of there and come home and be around for the services and, and, uh, and be with my family and be close to all of them at that time. And um, after that, I felt a little more sick and a little more sick and um, woke up one morning, and I couldn't move my face, and that was a little scary. And uh, luckily, the doctor had given me his his home phone number, I called him and he said, get to the emergency room immediately. And I found out I had shingles and it attacked a nerve in my face. And um, when I got there, they said, that's about the worst thing you could get because it, uh, it affects your balance, your hearing, your taste and your sight. And um, it was, uh, a lot of people won't believe me or don't believe me, but it was much more painful than breaking my neck to have shingles in, uh, when it affects your facial nerve. And um, that was a lot scarier as well because I went, uh, I went to the doctors and specialists and everyone I could find and all of them said, uh, there's no, no formula. There's no way to tell you if you'll be back in six months or four years or if the nerve actually died and it'll never come back. So at that point I had to come to terms with the, with the possibility that my career was over and, um, and find a way to possibly be happy without tennis. And that was, uh, that was an amazing experience for me because my friends were around. My friends made me smile, even though half my face wasn't working. The other half was smiling. They were there to, to play cards with me, to, to watch movies with me, to take me out, drag me out when I probably didn't want to be seen at that time. And um, I thank them so much for that because they're, uh, they're all around me now at the, the good times when I'm celebrating U.S. Open victories or Davis Cup triumphs or anything like that, they're around me. And um, I know they'll be there in the hard times, too. And that, that made such a difference to me. And I think that was one of the biggest reasons I was back in, in six or eight months, which they said was the, about the quickest I could have possibly recovered uh, from that illness. And uh, before I knew it, I was back on tour, and I had a whole new attitude. And I was uh, so much more relaxed on the court. Uh, when I was younger, I put so much pressure on myself. Every time I lost a match, it would affect me for weeks. And... Um, 
now I knew I had friends and I had family that were going to love me whether I ever won a tennis match again. And uh, just letting that, letting that go and uh, being able to be out there and just caring about, uh, caring about the match and being a competitor, but also knowing that it is still a game and there are more important things in life has helped me become, in my opinion, a much better player. My ranking has shown that. My results have shown that. I think when I got hurt in 2004, I had one title. Uh, since then, I've, I've, I've gotten nine more and uh, reached number four in the world and done you know, all the stuff that, that Andrew Friedman wanted to talk about was all the tennis stuff that I don't, uh, I'm happy to talk about, but it, it really wasn't as important as, as my friends were and, and, uh, and my father was and, and how much I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about the, the relationships that I had and, and how lucky I am, not just because you know, I talk about all the time how lucky I am to be living my dream, to be playing a sport for a living. You know, it's, it's a joke. Anyone who makes it like it's tough or makes it like it's uh, harder than it really is is crazy. We get paid to, to play a game that, that I enjoyed as a kid, that I enjoy still, and I absolutely love it. But I also know I'm even luckier to have the friends that I do and to have the family that I do. And um, it made it so that I know whether or not I, I had to put on a suit and tie and go to work every day or, or do anything else in the, in the real world. As long as I had those friends, I was going to be happy. And um, there's really no substitute for that. And um, I've had some some successes, especially the Davis Cup, like you talked about, and you know the, those thrills are, are so high. But it still, uh, in my opinion, doesn't compare to the friends I have. So that's why I wanted to write the book was to show that uh, while I'm out there, while I'm showing my personality on the court a little bit, I'm not out there alone. Um, I'm out there with friends, and I wanted to to give credit to all them and also to give a ton of credit to my dad for making me the person that I am and to, uh, to let people know the, the story behind the guy you might see on TV just for a couple of hours at a time and, and uh, to make it feel like you know that person out there. And the people who read my book and when I hear them come up, or when I see them come up to me and tell me they read my book, it means so much, so much more to me. And I know that they, uh, they know a lot more about me than someone who just said they've seen me play or they've watched a, a certain match of mine. And um, to know that people are at times inspired by the book or they just have something they can relate to. Uh, not many people, I don't think, in here can relate to playing in front of 20,000 people at the US Open and dealing with the pressure of a break point or anything like that in a fifth set. But there's a ton of people just in this room, I'm sure, that can relate to, to illness in the family, to, to injuries, to, to health problems, to things like that. And I want to let people know that just because you see someone on TV doesn't mean they're immune to those kind of situations, to those real life dramas and, um, and how they deal with them and how I dealt with them. Not necessarily how everyone else does, but how I dealt with them. And hopefully that can be uh, of, use, of, uh, of use to anyone else that, that's in that situation that might not have the, uh, the opportunity to write a book and, and tell people about it. So I was, uh, I was really proud to do that. And, um, and it, it, I think from now forever, I'll, uh, I'll appreciate when people do come up to me and tell me they read the book and it, it meant a lot to them because they relate to it in a, in a certain way, whether it's just through, uh, through one family thing, through one health thing, anything like that. If they relate to it, it, it really means a lot to me. And um, that's why I'm, uh, I'm so proud I'm an author. And it's a little shocking that at 28 years old, I have a, I have a book about, <laughs> about my life. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of it and, and happy I, uh, I went through that whole experience. That's it. <laughs> Thanks. We'll, we'll do Q&A. You can just okay. stand up here with my son's chair. Sure. Chair. All right. I'm going to so, sit over uh, here. What, why don't we uh, start Q&A? So, uh, and you could just, uh, if you have a question, you could just start, like, get, get by the microphone. And we could just uh, line up there. Um, while we're waiting for some people to get up there, why don't I all just kind of throw out the first question, James? Is were you um, were you surprised at how well received your book, your, your, how, how um, your book was well received, like out there, and it did so well in terms of the New York Times bestseller and things like that? Yeah, a little bit. I had um, obviously never been through this situation before or knew what to expect, but um, I had been told by every publisher that tennis books generally don't do very well, and for some reason they didn't listen to me when I say it's not, it isn't really a tennis book. It's more about my life. It's not, uh, it's not just tennis scores or, or updates or anything like that. It's, it's really a book about my life. And, um, so, and I also, but they, they were also skeptical because I couldn't do a normal book tour. A normal book tour is so many cities and so many days and you have to keep going and going and doing the, all the shows, the Letterman's, the Leno's and all those kind of things. And, um, I really didn't have the time to do that cause I was busy trying to uh, trying to play tennis too so I think they were really skeptical and 
all the people at the publishing company were so happy when they saw the results. I, I think they, they expected the worst, and uh, as, it, as it started happening, they were really excited, and, uh, and I was happy that, that uh, it made them so happy, too. Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks. Um, really enjoy watching you play. Thanks. Um, so you were in uh, People's Sexiest Man Alive. <laughs> and I just want to know. That's not the question I expected from you. <laughs> well, but the, the reason I'm asking is, do you have to lobby for that? Or, you know, because yeah, I can get my Should people, I put in a good word for you? <laughs> I would love that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I actually generally have to lobby against it, because I get made fun of so much in the locker room for that. But it's... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's something, uh, another thing I never really expected growing up since I was about five feet tall with a back brace in high school. I, I didn't think I'd ever be in, in People magazine for anything. Um, so the first time I was, I thought it was a joke. And um, since then, now I just try to hide them. And, and I, like I said, I get made fun of a lot in the locker room. Andy Roddick is merciless. Don't listen to whatever <laughs> anyone else says. But um, it, it's something that I just laugh at because some people take it really seriously and I am not one of those people because I know, I, I honestly still think of myself as the five foot tall kid with the back brace that had plenty of girls that were friends but not a lot of girlfriends. And, uh, yeah. and so I, I, I don't take that stuff too seriously. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> So um, at last year's U.S. Open, uh, your brother got a lot of airtime. He did. What's your relationship with your brother? Um, he's unbelievable. He's uh, a big brother that I couldn't ask for any more. He's someone that I look up to literally and figuratively. He's, um, he's about the nice guy. He's, he's, uh, I think someone, one of his friends in high school described him best. He's the kind of person you love to hate but he's too nice to, because yeah, he's, uh, everything comes easy to him. He went through high school, I honestly don't think I saw him carry a book once through high school and had straight A's. Then he went to Harvard, got good grades, barely did any work, tennis came easy to him. Um, you know, just one of those guys that seems like everything comes so easy, but he'll also, if, if, he's, if he's got a coat on and you're cold, he's gonna give it to you. If he's got, uh, if he's got money in his pocket, he'll give it to you. Anything he has, he'll, he'll give away to, to help out a friend or anyone else. And so you just can't, you can't be angry at him for being, uh, for everything coming that easy. And um, now he, he travels with me once in a while. He lives with me down in Tampa and he, um, I don't know, he, he enjoys the good life. He gets, I think this week, he, last week he was with me in Delray Beach. This week I think he decided to go back to Tampa, work on the golf game, really needs to, to rest a little more. And uh, he's not sure, he's got a couple options. A couple people invite him to some parties out in Las Vegas. And so I, I'm actually almost at the point where I want to hate him, but uh, he's, uh, he's too great a guy. And uh, you want, you just, I just absolutely want the best for him. And I know once he does uh, actually set his mind to something, he'll be, uh, he'll be impressive in, in whatever it is he does. But he's only 31, so he'll, he'll figure it out one of these days. Hey, I uh, really enjoy watching you play as well. And Thanks. when I uh, when I do watch you play, the one thing the commentators are always on about is uh, records in five set matches. Mm -hmm. um, was wondering if you could a little bit talk about how the rhythm of a match goes. You know, you finish three sets that might have been the end, but now you go the fourth and the, mm -hmm. and the fifth, and and maybe some specifics about some of yours, which have been just amazing, dramatic uh, performances. Yeah, well. Um, and then I wanted to know if Djokovic does you uh, <laughs> at all. But. I don't think he does. I, I, I've, I've seen a couple of people do some impre impersonations of me, and I, I never realized how, uh, how foolish I looked out there, I guess. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but I always think they're funny. And um, five setters are rough. You know, it's just, it's what you train for. It's uh, what you put in the long hours on the track, on the field, doing tons of sprints and everything for, so you, you feel okay to continue after that. I'm sure the commentators talked about my bad record in five setters for many, for many years before this. So um, I, I think a lot of that was just coincidence. You know, it's, it's like one of those baseball statistics where they have every different statistic in the world and I think some of them are just random you know a guy's batting 323 on Tuesdays in April when <laughs> it's a full moon and I mean I think those are just sometimes they're a little they're a little random and my early matches you know one of them was against Leighton when my body just gave out I was still young and I wasn't ready for a five setter in the heat against a player of his caliber and ended up getting heat stroke basically out there and then I had another tough one with him where I think it was the year he 
he made it to the finals of the U.S. Open again, and he beat me by one break in the, the fifth set. And uh, then my match with Agassi was just obviously could have gone either way, you know, a point here and there. But um, you don't really think about going five sets at the beginning of the match. I always treat every match like a sprint. You know, they, they could end up being a marathon, but you try to win every point you can at the beginning, give every bit of effort you can right at the beginning to, to get a lead and build a lead. And then, you know, even as long as they are, you don't you don't worry about the ups and downs. And, you know, there's going to be plenty of them and hope you're, uh, you're on an upswing at the end. And uh, luckily, the last few uh, five setters I've had, I've, I've had better results. And and I, I never thought it was going to be an issue. I, I know I'm physically able to, to compete for five sets, and uh, I'm pretty sure I have it. Uh, I feel like I have it mentally to deal with uh, whatever pressure comes in that fifth set, and um, then you just got to deal with being a little sore the next day. But that's, uh, that's a, a welcome relief when you win a five-setter. Thanks. Hi, James. Um, hey. Congratulations again on the uh, Davis Cup win. It was Thanks. definitely yeah. a pleasure to watch. Thanks. It's good to see you guys come through. Um, so actually, um, in your book, you mentioned that you're uh, in favor of, of allowing coaching yeah. in, um, in professional tennis. And I was just kind of curious if you could talk a little more about that and maybe how you think that would impact the game. Well, I think one thing that, uh, well, first of all, I'm in favor of trying it. Uh, I'd like <laughs> to see how it works because uh, the way things are, I don't see a problem with trying anything, with trying something new, because it might uh, it might infuse a little more life into it, get a little more um, media attention. And if you put coaches out there, I think you're going to get a few more personalities. Um, there's some personalities out on tour that you don't really see out on the court. You know, I think Marty Fish. I don't know if any of you guys know him. He's one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet in the locker room. I mean, he can make he can make anyone laugh. It, people that barely speak English, he's cracking them up. And uh, <laughs> and then he goes out on the court and he's really serious and he's you know very competitive he's getting down on himself sometimes and even in his press conferences you don't see it that much so um, I think maybe if you put a coach out there there's a ton of personalities there that you might get a chance to see if they put a mic on them you can hear what they're doing you can hear what they're saying you can hear exactly how pros go through it I think um, sometimes you hear commentators talking about what they think players should do and uh, I don't want to sp uh, you know Pick, pick on any of them specifically, but a lot of times they don't know what they're talking about. So, um, but if you hear a coach, you'll understand, and, and I think that'd be funny too, because a commentator might say one thing, it'll go down to the coach, and the coach might say the exact opposite, and then you could laugh at the commentator for being wrong. But um, I, uh, I just think you're going to put uh, more personalities out there so the fans can see that. They can maybe learn a little more about the game as to how players are adjusting, what they're doing, if their opponent's giving them trouble, how they maintain their focus and uh, when they're winning and deal with whatever ups and downs are going to come. And um, Also, I think... It's unfortunately somewhat prevalent that there's coaching that already goes on on tour. Uh, I've seen it so many times where if a guy's on the si same size as coach, they're, you know, they're covering their mouth, they're, they're saying something, they're giving them signals. And I just figure you might as well level the playing field when half the tour is already getting coached. And my, my coach, Brian Barker, is about the most moral guy in the world. And he would never even think about saying anything besides let's go James or come on James. So No, no Williams whiteboard? <laughs> no, he doesn't have the Williams whiteboard. <laughs> but um, so I, I figure you might as well just level the playing field because ne the umpires never do anything about coaching. And it's pretty, it's pretty obvious at times. And so I figure you might as well just level the playing field and see how that works instead of, uh, instead of having it be a little bit a little underhanded and somewhat getting around the rules just um just let them be out there and I, I think you still have to go out and execute the shots it's not like a coach is going to go out there and win a match for you and um even my coach will admit to that it's the players that are out there that are doing the work and so no matter how brilliant a coach is they can't go out there and win a match for you so i don't think it's going to change who's number one in the world who's number two in the world or anything like that i think it's just going to uh maybe add to the level of the game Great, thanks no problem Hey, I just had a, uh, maybe it's a really weird question, but just in general, like I've watched tennis for a while. I grew up playing tennis, and uh, I actually really hate the fact that they've implemented this new, like, spot shot, mm -hmm. uh, like, automated, you know, telling whether or not it's in or out. You get yeah. three challenges, or in a um, yeah. tiebreaker, you get an extra one. I just kind of wanted to get a sense of your opinion of it, and just sort of if people um, on the tour talk about it, if, if everybody hates it, if some people like it, some people don't, um, how exactly, if they took a vote, or how exactly that was implemented, and, um, you know, what your opinion was. Yeah, again, I was happy to see them trying things. I'm definitely in favor of, of attempting things and hearing what the fans think. And uh, you're actually one of the few that, that say they don't like it. Uh, uh, from what I've heard from most fans, they, they seem to like it uh, as they're showing it on the big screen. The whole crowd, you always hear them go, ooh. And <laughs> so it seems like they're, they're into it. Um, 
but in terms of as a player, we've dealt with human error for so long that that's part of the game that if we were to go back to that, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But it is a little bit of a nice safety net when you're in a big point, and especially in a tiebreaker or something, and a point that could change the uh, the outcome of the match, really, because so many of these matches come down to one or two points. And if you get a bad call, you know you can be at peace, you know, peace of mind. If you just get it, put it up on the screen, okay, it was definitely out, you move on. You don't need to think about, well, if I had gotten that point, if the umpire had it wrong, and you, you can you can be a little bit uh, more at peace and not worry about it. So as a player, I, I like it. Um, I know Roger definitely does not like it. He's spoken out about it many times. But um, I, I've always said if it's, I think we should leave it up to the fans. For us, we can deal with human error. Um, I, I, I like it, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tied to it. I'm not married to it, really. I think if the fans don't like it, if they start saying, you know, we really think it would be back to, we want to get it back to having human error and seeing the, the players explode at the umpires and <laughs> bring back John McEnroe and that kind of stuff, then yeah. that's fine with me. <laughs> I got no problem with that. You cannot be serious. <laughs> I think I'm just so used to focusing on, on when I'm not being a professional player, having the other person actually making the call on the other side. So I think in professional tennis, I always really liked that they actually had line judges. And just, yeah, you know, I like it too. Always fine, so. <laughs> Hi, James. Thanks for coming out. Um, it's been interesting in, in recent elections how politicians have used the internet to get out to their supporters. I wonder if professional athletes, are you guys thinking about ways that you can use the internet to reach out to your fan base? I mean, through blogs and things like that. Do you think that's important or do you think you should... Just focus on winning your matches. What, what well, you first focus has got to be winning matches because yeah. no one's going to care what you have to say That's if you're ranked 200 in the world. <laughs> but um, but then once you do that, if you have the time to get out there on the internet, um, you know, once this whole MySpace phenomenon happened, I heard about a few of the athletes that would get on there, and um, I think the Bryan brothers were one of the ones that I was uh, that I noticed the most. They got out there and they had all their Olympic pictures and Davis Cup pictures and all those things out there on the MySpace page and. They had just legions of fans writing into them all the time. I never actually did that. Uh, but they, uh, they got a lot of positive feedback from it. And I, I think having the blogs, I have a, website, a personal website. And I think having those, it gives fans a chance to, uh, to interact a little bit. I get a bunch of fan mail there. And I try to respond to as much of it as I can. And uh, I think that's, that is important. And it gives people a little bit of a, of a sense of uh, getting to know you and of feeling like they're, they're in touch with you. And, um, there's a new website that I actually have just recently heard about called Yard Barkers, where they've got a, a ton of athletes from different uh, from different sports, and they'll write a little blogs about what's going on in their lives, what's going on in the on the uh, on the circuit, or you know, on the tour, and the basketball court, on the soccer field, whatever. And uh, I actually like that idea a lot, with the fact that e people can any sports fan can get on there and find out about all different sports. So then it might get a, a little bit of a crossover. Someone that's normally a soccer fan might see something interesting that I was writing, and you know pick up a little something and, and become a tennis fan. Someone's a tennis fan might become a football fan because, you know, Donovan McNabb wrote something on there. And you get uh, a sense of if you can hear from a bunch of different pro athletes from, from all, all, uh, all sports, I think that's something that would be really good. That's great. And then just a follow-up question. Um, I think that was a good idea about allowing coaching to make it more interesting for the, the fans at home watching on TV. Do you have any other ideas for making it more interesting to watch it on TV? Or do you feel like it's fine how it is? Or uh, I think there's there's some changes that could be made. Uh, from the one thing I would do if I was if I had complete control over it would be to shorten the season. Uh, I think the amount of time I mean, once the U.S. opens over, it seems like a lot of the the fan base kind of feels like this, the year should be over. And then there's we've got about six more tournaments indoors and uh, in Europe when it doesn't seem like people understand that those tournaments are still important. And I really don't think they should be that important because people should be winding down. And I get jealous when I talk to other athletes that have real off seasons where they, you know, I, I'm back on the court in my off season after about a week or two weeks off and I'll get back at the same time and I'll, I'll be working out next to a baseball player and say, yeah, I just had two months off. I was traveling. And it makes me want to hate them <laughs> thinking, thinking I played the wrong sport. But to have a real off season will make a big difference in the amount of injuries, mm -hmm. I think the length of our careers. And so I would, uh, I would shorten the season to make, it would also make the matches, each match a little more important because you, you know you only have a certain amount of time to gain however many points you need. Yeah, it seems like with Davis Cup, it goes out throughout the whole year. It'd almost be fun if they did it in like a two-week stretch where you played all in a yeah. row. Yeah, you know? uh, and that's something we've suggested to the ITF so many times that they don't even listen anymore. Yeah. They don't listen to the players. They think uh, they think the system is fine the way it is, and I don't think they, they care that our bodies are breaking down a little sooner than they should. Thanks. 
Hi, nice to meet awesome. you. Um, I have uh, three little boys at home who are passionate tennis players and are really excited that you're here today, so it's great. Um, <laughs> and um, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a kid, sort of growing up with a lot of tennis, obviously, and mm -hmm. if you ever felt then, or, or maybe looking back now, that you missed out on something because you focused so much on that. No, I uh, I tried to have as, as normal of a childhood as I could. It was uh, at times tough, but I... Uh, I didn't go to the tennis academies or anything like that. I didn't spend six hours a day on the court. I didn't do anything crazy like that. I went to normal public school, would play for an hour after school, an hour and a half maybe sometimes, play the tournaments once in a while on the weekend. And um, as I got a little older, I started sacrificing a little more, uh, missing a few parties here and there late in high school, going to tournaments, traveling in the summer a little bit to tournaments. but. I really did my best to, you know, I went to prom, I did the, you know, partying a little bit in high school with the friends and, um, and of course my schoolwork, that wasn't even an option. My parents made sure that the schoolwork was done before the tennis. So, um, I tried to have as normal of a child as I could and any sacrifices I made were something I was something I wanted to do. And I feel like it, it makes me appreciate some of the things I've gotten now and some of the, um, some of the things I've achieved so much more uh, special because I knew I sacrificed a few things. I couldn't be completely a normal high school kid that, that would stay up you know, late every night and not get enough rest and go out and party uh, as much as they did or anything like that. So I, um, but I, I didn't want to do that. That wasn't exactly what was, what was for me. So I, I knew how much I wanted to, to improve at tennis. I knew I wanted to get better and see how, how good I could be, whether that was to get a scholarship to college or just to be a, maybe to be an All-American in college, anything like that, or even just to play in the, the top six on my college team. Whatever that was, I wanted to see how good I could be. And um, it turned out uh, I got to be a little better than I ever expected. So um, that was a nice, uh, a nice bonus. But I, I really just wanted to see how, how good I could do. And even if I hadn't had the success I've had, it would have been worth whatever sacrifices I made. I still got to, to do a lot of normal things. I still got to go to college for two years and, and really appreciated that. And have friends from college that I still stay very close to. And so I got to, to meet a million, a million new people and so many more opportunities open through tennis that I, I never would have re regretted any of it. Right. Thanks. No problem. Hi, James. Uh, you probably don't remember me. I was uh, about a year behind you in the Fairfield Public Schools. Yep. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, do, I have to say, I do remember a particular uh, evening when you turned in a truly dominant performance in the team dodgeball, uh, fourth grade versus fifth grade <laughs> at Stratfield School. <laughs> But uh, as the fourth one of my graders, crowning moments, we weren't we weren't particularly happy about the whole you know fourth grade versus fifth grade dynamic. But it also seemed d uh, doubly unfair that we were going up against you. I guess you, you sort of just answered my question. I was going to ask you know it was clear to us that something strange was going on. I'm, I'm, we wanted to know at what point you sort of realized that you know um, sports is being a professional athlete is something that I could actually do uh, for. You know, um, I probably didn't realize it because, as you remember, in that fourth grade, fifth grade matchup, I was uh, I was probably smaller than most of the fourth graders. I was not a not exactly a giant when I was growing up, and I finally grew uh, between my junior and senior years. So when I grew, that's when I started having a lot more success. Uh, I think by then, I uh, I got to be number one in the the country in the in the USTA, and before that, I never even thought that would be possible or anything like that. But still then, I was I was pretty green and had no idea what, what to expect. I had agents talking to me, and I really didn't understand why. And then I went to play in the Junior U.S. Open, which I never thought they would have given me the chance to do, and was winning matches there. And I came pretty close to winning a match in the, the actual qualifying of the U.S. Open. And uh, to me, it was still all just fun, and I didn't, uh, didn't think much of it. I planned on going to college for four years and, and trying the tour after that. When I finally realized like it was it was a possibility was when I played um, I played a, a futures tournament, which is like the real minor leagues of tennis, and I played it over my my Christmas break in my sophomore year of, of college, and so I was still dealing with finals and going to school and traveling down there, and I thought, okay, this will be fun. Maybe I'll get a match or two in and see how good these guys are, and I ended up winning the tournament. And when I did that, I thought, okay. Maybe it, these guys are all trying to do this for a living, and I actually won the tournament. So maybe there is a chance that if I were to put my uh, put all my eggs into this basket, really try go after it and finish with school and and uh, concentrate just on tennis, that I'll have a chance to to make this a, a career. But it didn't happen until late for me because I had, like I said, normal public high school and Fairville High and everything, and felt like I was just a normal kid, and except for in that. 
you know, dodgeball when I was. I also did pretty well in the badminton tournament. I often remember that in, in high school. So I, uh, I felt pretty good about those. But I didn't know if that was going to translate into being a pro athlete. <laughs> good to see you again. Uh, hi. hi, thanks for coming. Um, so at Google, we always ask these kind of offhanded questions, such as, you know, if you were a serial, what would you be? So I figured I had to bring that aspect and ask you, if you could play anyone on the tennis court, you know, dead, alive, pro, play or not, who would it be and why? Uh, a tennis player or just any person? Pretty much just any person. You said you're close to your family. You know, it could be anything. Um, let's see. Probably... When I was growing up, I absolutely idolized, as I'm sure a million people did, Michael Jordan. So for me to go out there and, and see how athletic, he, how he could translate his athleticism on a basketball court to a tennis court and uh, just get to hang out with him, basically, and maybe even be able to say I beat him at something. If I, I, I wouldn't you know, say in tennis. I would just say I beat Michael Jordan. I think that would be something that would be, uh, I'd be pretty happy about. You should welcome him. He's already gone to baseball, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. <next> step. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No Thanks. problem. Hi, James. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. Pleasure. Um, you, you alluded to this earlier in, in another question when you said that the season's really long and fitness is really important. I know some players even travel with conditioning coaches as well. Like, mm -hmm. what, I mean, I was just wondering if you could talk a little about, like, fitness and how you train, like, how you select tournaments that you want to participate in, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I travel with a conditioning coach uh, a decent amount of time as well. He's he's actually here in San Jose with me, um, but we do a ton of stuff. Uh, off season is the only chance we get to really build up a, a, as much strength as we possibly can because the rest of the year you end up somewhat breaking down your body. Every every match you play, you don't get the chance to, to do a lot of lifting, to do a lot of stuff because you want to be prepared for each match. As far as which ones we play, uh, the schedule somewhat dictates that. You have to play the four Grand Slams. There's nine of these what's called Master Series tournaments that you're, you have to play. And then after that, you pick the tournaments that you want to play, you feel like will prepare you best for the others. And also, um, for me, I like playing the ones in the States. It's just, for me, it's easier. Uh, I end up usually having friends in whatever area I go to and, and getting to catch up with other people. And I tend to do better at the ones in the States too. Uh, they're on the hard courts. I mean, I'm never, I'm probably never going to go play the, the South American clay court swing because I just don't think I'd succeed as, as much. So I play the ones I think I have the best chance of doing well at. And for me, a lot of times now, it's the ones I think I will have the most fun at. And it, it used to be at times, some people play just the ones they can get into, depending on their ranking. Luckily, now I can get into whichever ones, but it's just a matter of which ones I think I have the best chance of doing well at. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. My daughters would have loved to be here. <laughs> but uh, in my um, I would love to see more doubles coverage on TV. Mm -hmm. And also, I'd love to see more of the top players play doubles, mm -hmm. just as a way to make doubles play more popular. What are your thoughts? Well, um, I think the Bryans are doing a great job uh, publicizing doubles. They've uh, been on an unbelievable campaign. They work... They work so hard, actually, even in the off season, doing little exhibitions, doing charity events, doing everything they can to promote doubles. And I think they're incredibly exciting when they play. Uh, I've seen them so many times in Davis Cup now. Um, to get the top players, singles players, to play doubles is going to be some, somewhat tough because, like I said, the schedule is so long mm -hmm. to play even more matches and add those on. It, it can sometimes take away from your ability to have as much success on the singles court, which is what most of the guys are, are really competing for. So it's tough. I, I play doubles once in a while. I think it's a lot of fun. It's sometimes an easier way to get to practice instead of getting out on the practice court. And uh, I, I just don't know exactly how they would uh, get a lot more singles players to play doubles outside of raising the prize money a whole lot. But I don't think that even that, uh, you know, you can throw as much money as you want at Roger Federer, and he's probably not going to play. Um, but I think you, uh, in terms of getting more exposure, I think the Tennis Channel is starting to, to uh yeah. to cover it a little bit more but uh i don't know i don't know why it really doesn't get more coverage because i've heard some sort of stats where 70 percent of the players that that play tennis play doubles so i would think they'd be even more interested in it but i think it's tough without the real name players uh people don't want to go exactly. see right. uh simon Asplin and julian Knoll or people that no one would know go play doubles instead of they'd much rather go they might be better doubles players but they would still rather watch roger federer and rafael nadal right. play doubles right. Right. Yeah. okay That's thanks all. 
Oh, no. Or 30, I'm sorry. Um, we want to leave a few minutes uh, for James to sign a few books. So if you have a question, feel free to try to catch him at the end, but let's try to make this the last question here. Ooh, uh, I had to. Better make it a good one. Um, <laughs> firstly, I, I saw you playing that epic five-setter in uh, Melbourne last month, so congratulations. Okay. That was great. Thanks. Um, I guess my more interesting question was... Um, Mark Philippoussis has just uh, had his reality romance show <laughs> last year. So we're going to start and end with these kind of questions. All right. <laughs> what, what's next, James, for you? Uh, not a reality romance show. That is definitely not next for me. Uh, Mark's a great guy. Uh, I heard he made the right choice. Um, but... Um, I can't see myself doing anything like that. I know when I'm done playing, I'm going to take a little time away and probably hang out with my brother a lot, play a little golf, uh, relax for six months, and, and feel like I can kind of decompress after all the traveling I've been doing on tour and everything like that. And then I'd like to go back and finish school. Um, I've got two years left at Harvard. They take you back any time. So I'd like to go back and finish and then figure out in those two years exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. Uh, those two years, I'll study something a little more interesting than economics like I was doing there, uh, maybe political science, maybe African-American studies, sociology, I don't know, something that I'd, I'd be a little more interested in and figure out if there's anything else that I'm as interested in as tennis. And I definitely want to get out of the tennis world for a little while and then see if I want to get back in and do any commentary or Davis Cup coaching or anything like that. But uh, I want to get out of it for a little while, and that all could be dictated by... Uh, my uh, situation if I, you know, married, kids, and uh, from what I hear, you don't have the, the say at that point, so, <laughs> I mean, I, I, all, the, all this may, may go out the window if, if my wife says, no, we're moving to, to another country and you're going to work in the fields or something, then that's, you know, then, then apparently that's what I'm going to do, so we'll see. Thanks. Have a big round of applause for James. Thanks. Um, Uh, a couple of really quick announcements. Uh, if James can stick around for a few minutes, we'll just have him sign a few books outside. Uh, we're just a table set up out there. Um, and I know Bill Rapp, the tournament director for the SAP Open, well, he was supposed to be here and he's not able to make it, so I'll give a plug for the SAP Open going on right now. I think James will be playing tomorrow night. Do, do you know who yet? Yeah, I play Jesse Levine. All right, so young American Jesse Levine, and uh, so he's. we're hoping for a James Andy Roddick final this Sunday. That would be nice to see. Um, so I want to thank James again. I also want to thank a few other people behind the scenes. Um, his longtime agent, Carlos Fleming, who really helped put this together. He's not here today. Um, but Brian Edwards also, another representative from IMG, has made it out. We want to thank him for coming. I also want to thank um, a few people behind the scenes that really helped make this happen. Tyler Shores, who's the coordinator for the authors at um, Google program. I also want to thank uh, a lot of the uh, other, t uh, you know, kind of hardcore tennis players and fans um, here at Google. Um, Adam Lewis, who helped coordinate. Amelia Anderson, Brandon Badger, and Lauren Barnica who also helped uh, organize this event. So thanks a lot, guys. And uh, if you can get, uh, get your book uh, signed by uh, James right outside in front. Thanks.